In the 1970s, environmentalists and politicians in the Imperial Corps quivered in their seats over the prospect of a population explosion. Malthusian prophecies of total collapse and Thanos-esque proposals of racial extermination pervaded political thought. For many, it seemed the end of the world was at our doorstep. Our cities are going to be choked with people. They're going to be choked with traffic. They're going to be choked with crime. And one of the main worries was that food production wouldn't be able to support the billions of mouths that would be born in the coming decade. More famines and shortages. But then the Green Revolution happened and everything was supposedly better. Labor-saving technology and fossil fuel-laden chemicals pulled the world back from the precipice of famine and death. At least, that's the dominant narrative that has been pushed since the 1970s. Today, though, we're going to deconstruct this story about industrial farming and answer a nagging question. Can small-scale regenerative farming feed the world? This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream, which now comes with Nebula for free when you sign up using the link in the description. The so-called Green Revolution was a temporary patch on a much larger food system crisis. If anything, the industrial farming explosion in the 1970s, which implemented new labor-saving technologies like combine harvesters, high-yield varieties like dwarf wheat, and the consolidation of farmland to increase global food production, seems to have done more harm than good. Part of this has to do with the fact that the Green Revolution substituted the cost of labor with that of fossil fuels. Instead of endless hours on the farm, landholders just used fossil fuels to power their harvesters, tillers, and develop synthetic fertilizers. For an aging farming population, this was great news. You could get the same yields you were getting before and only have to work two weeks in the spring and two in the fall. For the soil, the atmosphere, and the insect and bird populations, however, this new industrial agriculture spelled disaster. As a result of the tireless tilling practices of industrial agriculture, which churns up and kills the fragile microbiome and organic matter of the topsoil, the health of conventionally tilled soil is now diminishing at more than twice the rate that it's regenerating, a crisis which leading soil scientist Dr. Ratan Lal describes in one word, bleak. Our new fossil fuel agriculture, embodied in the miles of corn and soybean monocultures in the heartland of the United States, and now being pushed on the imperial periphery by agribusiness giants like Bayer Monsanto and Syngenta, has also meant significant greenhouse gas emissions, to the tune of 24% of our total global yearly emissions. And on top of that, industrial agriculture is killing waves of insects and birds and crushing the bodies of farm workers and prisoners forced to work grueling harvest hours for little or no pay. We stomach the mounting toll of industrial agriculture because it's supposedly feeding the world. Yet most of the monocropped farms in the imperial core don't directly produce food going into our mouths. Most often, the vast fields of corn get churned into animal feed, fuel, or various sugars and additives that do eventually reach our mouths, but in an extremely roundabout way. In the Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa, also known as AGRA, an initiative backed by Bill Gates and the Rockefeller Foundation, reveals industrial farming's failure to feed the world. In the countries where AGRA operates, um, there's been a 30% increase in the number of uh, people who are suffering hunger, and the agricultural productivity is kind of the same as it was before AGRA began. Indeed, large-scale industrialized agricultural endeavors only account for 50% of global food production, and it's the farm that are producing the other 50% that we must look towards for an escape route out of our current unsustainable capitalist farming system. Before the combine harvester and the synthetic fertilizer, the world was feeding itself through the labor of millions of small-scale agricultural endeavors across the globe. Today, that's still the case. Small-scale farms produce 51% of the world's food. So the question of whether small-scale farming can feed the world is a short answer. Yes. But of course, it's a little more complicated than that. 
Regardless of whether it's regenerative or industrial, we are currently producing more food than we need, which means that hunger and food insecurity are less a question of production than one of distribution, access, and infrastructure, all of which are exacerbated by systems of oppression like racism, classism, imperialism, and capitalist exploitation. In the United States, for example, 40% of food is wasted, Yet there are thousands of marginalized communities suffering from food apartheid and access to nutritious and tasty food. All this is to say that as we transition away from large-scale fossil fuel-centric agriculture to small-scale agroecological pursuits, we must also transform our food systems outside of the farm. But before we get to the possible approaches to that gargantuan problem, we first need to understand why small-scale regenerative farming can not only heal our relationship with the land and reverse the effects of fossil capitalism, but also provide a breeding ground for the masses to topple our global capitalist system. In the outskirts of Albany, New York, lies a farm. Drawing on African indigenous roots and knowledge, farmers there have turned a patch of land from barren soil into a thriving ecosystem in a matter of years. They're growing food that's going to communities of color that lack access to tasty and nutritious food because racial capitalism deemed their area not fit for profit and ultimately fresh farmed produce. And they're growing this food while sequestering carbon into the soil. Instead of big tractors, there are hands in the dirt. Instead of miles of monoculture, there are acres of polyculture. Instead of industrial agriculture, there is Afro-Indigenous permaculture. This farm is called Soulfire Farm, and it's just one of the countless examples of why small-scale farming is essential in the imperial core and periphery alike. To be clear, when I say small-scale farm, I mean agricultural practices based on traditional knowledge that seeks to grow a diverse range of plants for local consumption while healing the soil in the process. This can take a number of forms, from backyard intensive farming operations to permaculture-informed food forests to indigenous-led hemp-based operations. All of these are devoid of tilling, chemicals, and highly mechanized processes that divorce farmers from the land and ultimately lead to a world where food comes from the grocery store and not the ground. In terms of the environment, a regenerative small-scale farm can be a mighty tool in the work to forge resilience and tackle the climate crisis. If done correctly, a small-scale regenerative farm can capture carbon in its soils to the tune of 1-2 to two metric tons per hectare, promote a biodiverse landscape through crop diversification and perennial trees and flowers, which also happens to build resilience in the face of extreme weather. And it can do all of that while using significantly fewer fewer fossil fuels and toxic chemicals, all while achieving similar yields. Alongside the clear environmental necessity for small-scale farming, these farms have the potential to be a nexus for change. Farms are what keep us alive and tie us together, which means that they can be a space for affinity groups and organizations to gather and strategize, to strengthen bonds. And Soulfire Farms does exactly that. They offer up their farmland to leftist organizers and communities in need of a space to build power. But farmers themselves also have power in numbers and can be agents of change. Just look towards India, where the might of farmers was on display for months, bringing key entrance roads to Delhi to a standstill in protest of a proposed neoliberal farm bill. At the end of the day, the small-scale farm can instigate big change, but that change can only happen when thousands, if not millions, turn back to the soil and put in the hard work that regenerative agriculture requires to heal the land. You give everything to the land. And then you yourself physically wear out, mentally you wear down, and spiritually you start to question. That's a quote from a small-scale farmer in the US who reveals the stark reality of developing viable farming alternatives under capitalism. Farming is hard work. 
There are no two ways about it. Indeed, the rate of suicide amongst farmers, whether in the US or India, is extremely high compared to other occupations. A 2016 study of alternative farms in Ohio reveals what most small-scale farmers already know. The labor requirements of small-scale agriculture are on average 15% higher than that of industrial agriculture. And in our current global capitalist system, where fossil fuels have artificially driven the price of food to the floor, that extra labor often goes unrecognized in the form of 65-hour work weeks or hordes of unpaid interns. This shows us that a regenerative farming revolution must be accompanied by a full-scale societal one as well. Fortunately, the two can be, and indeed are, interconnected. In the imperial periphery, anti-capitalist indigenous-led farmers movements like La Via Campesina are already showing the world that another, more nurturing reality can exist. Under the umbrella of Via Campesina, farmers' protests like that in India and Indonesia are exposing the untenable reality of life as a peasant farmer under capitalism. But if we look outside the bounds of capitalism, the small-scale farm can act as an anchor to a thriving communist, anarchist, eco-socialist, or even solar punk society, wherein the farm and the work of healing the soil and nourishing the community aren't dumped onto one person, but shared throughout the community via farming co-ops like in Cuba or community work shares. The small-scale farm is bursting with radical change for our environments, our bodies, our relationships, and even our politics. But but that change can't happen from behind our screens. We must go out into the land, find those toiling away in the soil, and help them build a revolutionary tomorrow. If you're curious about what a farm of the future looks like, or what small-scale farms now are paving the way towards the future, then you're in luck. I wrote a small section about future agroecological farms and the tools we can use to get there, but I cut it out of this video because it felt like a tangent and I wanted to appease the YouTube algorithm. So instead, I've uploaded that section as an extended edition of this video on the streaming platform my creator friends and I built called Nebula. The bonus content replaces this ad because there aren't any ads on Nebula. And you'll not only see a lot of extended editions, exclusive content, and ad-free videos over on Nebula from me, but also from channels like Second Thought and Polymatter. Nebula allows viewers to support creators directly so they don't have to worry about the pesky YouTube algorithm. Nebula is awesome, but it's now made even better with our partnership with CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is the go-to streaming platform for thousands of top-tier documentaries, like the five-part documentary series The History of Food, which looks at everything from industrial agriculture to the invention of cooking. And because CuriosityStream loves supporting educational creators, we worked out a deal where if you sign up with the link below, not only do you get access to CuriosityStream, but you'll also get Nebula for free. And this isn't a trial. You'll have Nebula as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. What's even better is that CuriosityStream is offering a special deal for my viewers, 26% off their annual plan. That's a little over a dollar a month for both CuriosityStream and Nebula. By signing up, you'll not only directly support our changing climate, but you'll also gain access to thousands of documentaries and exclusive videos from your favorite creators. So if you want to support both our changing climate and hundreds of other educational content creators, go to curiositystream.com OCC or click the link in the description and sign up for CuriosityStream and Nebula for just $14.79 per year. That's 26% off. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. If you've already signed up for CuriosityStream, you can also support me by becoming an Our Changing Climate patron. Just pledging $1 a month gives me the financial stability I need to keep making more videos like this. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in two weeks.